Hi everyone, uh, we start again today with the Dauco seminars. It's been like a short uh, stop during the autumn, but here now in winter we start again. So today we start with our first seminar of the year and we have uh, our uh, invited speaker uh, Claudia Matarnicola. She comes from URAC in Bolzano in the north of Italy. It's an institute, well, she's the head of the Institute of Education. And I mean, she's an expert in remote sensing. She has been working some years now. <laughs> some. <laughs> we, uh, some. <laughs> snow, uh, soil moisture retrieving, and yeah, um, both in the optical and in the microwave part yes. of the spectrum. And she will uh, talk today about yeah, uh, snow trends, in, well, snow changes in global mountains over yeah, the last 20, 20 years. And after her, I will continue with the work that we are doing together in the same in the same path. Okay. Okay. So thank you, everyone, okay. and the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, Rafa, for the introduction. So, say so the first part of the seminar will be related to um, understanding and monitoring uh, hotspot of snow cover changes in mountain areas uh, in the period 2020 22. Uh, as you know, mountains are. are means there have been several studies that show that mountains have been undergone uh, several uh, uh, changes related to climate variability and also especially the issue that uh, temperature increase is uh, shown to be almost the double in the mountain with respect to global average and this of course has an impact on uh, several parts of the cryosphere specifically uh, snow cover and also of course the uh, glacier so it's well known that glaciers are treating almost everywhere and uh, of course to better understand these changes and also to quantify the changes there have been several methods for example uh, ground data of course also modeling and uh, uh, of course we have to mention as well remote sensing um, and in this case having the possibility to uh, um, have the um, data like with the uh, time span of more than 20 years of the same sensor allow us to have a continuity in time of the data and also to get a better um, idea of what is happening. So uh, at the end the aim of this talk would be really to show how in first sense which data and approaches we can use to monitor these changes um, in the period 2000-2018 because this was the first part of the study which is also mentioned there which has been published in 2020 and of course uh, as these data are still available um, these have been extended up to 2020, 2022 and the idea is of course to see what is the status in mountain at global level in these last two decades what are the elevation patterns what are the impact of the main um, meteorological parameters like temperature and precipitation um, see what are let's say the dynamics especially regarding uh, snow onset and snow melt and of course uh, understanding where also spatially are located these hotspot the main uh, data which have been used here so far are modis data which i guess all are uh, aware of and modis is definitely one of the most successful uh, mission in the story of the say satellite and earth observation because it was launched in 2020 2000 sorry and is still available and say the they foreseen that it will be available at least until 25. this means it's important that you have a unique sensor uh, with observation continuity in observation and of course uh, uh, this guarantee a co con consistency in the data set on the other side, uh, we have to see, we have to mention that now, with all data available, uh, we have the problem of where process the data. But of course, especially if you think to work on a larger scale or even global scale, uh, let's say you cannot think of download all the data on your server or on your laptop, uh, but you need to access some platform. There are many of them, uh, all with pro and cons. 
or some are working well, some less, but means you can imagine that also dealing with a large amount of data like not only MODIS but also Landsat, Sentinel and so on can be really demanding. In this case for this work uh, have been exploited the, the Google Earth engine which was already issue I think could say almost more than 10 years ago and where you can have plenty of data uh, for example all the modis data are available there not only the original but also the products there are also the sentinel data the landsat but also several model data and so on and the advantage is that you have everything in one platform um, let's say the disadvantage is of course that you have a bit to learn the language program which is a kind of JavaScript, uh, but means not so different from the others. And, uh, and then at the end, uh, you can simply download your results what, what, or what you need in principle. Uh, in this case, uh, we started from, uh, as the, um, let's say the aim was the snow cover, was mainly mod 10 A1. Uh, that provides information on, let's say, snow cover fraction, uh, then the global mountain shape and the water bodies to mask them. Um, there have been, now I will show some, let's say, just some ins. Um, for obtaining the snow cover area monthly or yearly, it was simply an averaging. Instead, for calculating the snow cover duration, so how many days the area was covered by snow, we had to do some uh, uh, filtering, say some interpolation approach, because you know, being an optical data set, this is affected by clouds. And this means that uh, you need to cope uh, with these holes uh, because of cloud coverage. Uh, after that, uh, Practically, you say you can count the days to obtain the snow cover duration, or you can evaluate also the first snow day and the last snow day. So it means the start and the end of the season. Um, and all these uh, routines have been uh, developed in Google Earth Engine. Uh, here are just some, let's say, more details on this. So this is a typical on a point. This is the typical, um, the northern hemisphere um, is continental area, the typical evolution of a snowpack. So you may have certain amounts of snow fall at the beginning of the season, but then starts, say, the season. Then you can have some fluctuation. Uh, but more or less, let's say the snowpack is uh, stable, and then uh, you may have a decrease of then, okay, you can have also some other snowfall at the end. So the idea is, of course, on one sense to calculate uh, the duration, of course, not of this ephemeral period, but rather of this one. So then you have to remove this one, and for this there will be a filtering of uh, a window, uh, so it means that uh, it was considered the starting of the season or the end of the season only if there were like five days consecutive of snow or of no snow. And then we set up a threshold of 50% uh, on snow cover fraction and upon this we calculate the number of days in practice. And this has been done, uh, let's say, considering all the mountain areas. Of course, this approach needs some validation, so which normally means compare with ground data. Uh, for this reason, I've been uh, searched for a lot of data uh, worldwide. I have to say that mainly they are distributed in Europe uh, and North America. For example, the Snowtel data are one of the most, uh, let's say, consistent data set, especially on the last 20, 25 years. But there, there are available also data that go up in the like beginning of the past century. Uh, in Europe, of course, there are several data sets. Uh, also in Russia, but there, in, say, in the eastern part, China and Russia, but there, um, let's say, they are not really up to date. At least, what is because there is a big uh, um, database where all these data sets are available. And also, I got through some connection, let's say, um, <laughs> data uh, for South America. Because also there, there are stations, but not, uh, let's say, at least it's not so um, available like in, uh, like in Europe or in the US. And of course, with the idea here, you can see 
uh, the validation of the snow cover duration, first day of snow and last day of snow, because snow cover fraction, it means it was already the, the modest product, which have been already pub, um, validated in many papers, uh, and it shows normally an accuracy which range between uh, 87 and 92, 93%, depending on the different areas. Uh, and of course there are many work also on mountain areas because MODIS, we have to say also that uh, uh, MODIS up to now is the only sensor with a high resolution, so 500 meters and available daily on a daily time, on daily scale. Uh, of course also Landsat, but Landsat has a higher resolution but is available every 16 days, so for studies dedicated to monitoring a uh, so fast processes like melting or snow dynamics definitely we need a daily acquisition practically and here are just let's say some figures for the validation you can see that uh, there always been a very good correlation in general also considering a different percentage for example of uh, mm, forest cover because forest can be a problem in different areas and also different uh, uh, latitude and here you can see also distribution of the error which are normally in the let's say is really like roughly between zero and five days. So just to give an idea, because of course this is very important, uh, because based on these maps, what have been calculated is a trend over the 20 or the 23 years, and of course uh, um, they've been applied uh, Menkendall statistics to understand if these trends are significant or not, and moreover a filter, so if the changes which have been detected is uh, uh, in the range of this error, these have been uh, not considered. Because of course uh, you may have, I don't know, a change in the snow cover duration of five days, but then you are not sure if these five days are really due to the change or to the error which is inside. So it's been applied, let's say, several filters and what is presented is just the data which are consistent with these different criteria. So, after all this work, I think it was very uh, interesting, uh, you know, because when you work uh, on your laptop with the code and so on, I would say it was very interesting when come up a map like this, uh, which showed, this was the first, the global changes for snow cover area, uh, from 2000 to 2018 in the different uh, mountain areas because as I said I just filter out all the rest and uh, and you can see here with positive and negative where the dark blue and the dark uh, red are respectively the one which are significant positively or negative and you can see that there are several patterns worldwide and uh, for example here, there are several here, for example in Iran, also something in the Alps, North America, especially one of the biggest is definitely in South America, because you know also that they have been suffered since the last 10 years of these mega droughts, um, and that means this is clearly revealed uh, by this map. Another which was able to be connected is to analyze the dependency on meteorological factors, namely precipitation and temperature. Here was the idea to understand these changes here selected in three different moments, I say mainly autumn, uh, start of the season, center of the season, melting and summer, and vice versa of course for the southern hemisphere and see uh, if these changes are correlated um, with the temperature or precipitation and which one of the two factors has the main impact because um, using this uh, this um, dominance weight approach is possible to understand and you see here like a scale uh, like the blue is dominated by precipitation and the red is dominated by temperature but there could be also like intermediate situations and here just as a global picture we can see that in general um, let's say autumn and uh, winter are more dominated by uh, precipitation, so in, in this case if there is less snow is because there is less precipitation or less precipitation falling as snow. 
Instead, definitely the melting period, especially in, um, let's say, the northern hemisphere, is definitely dominated by changes in temperature. So it means, in most of the cases, uh, uh, there is an increase of the temperature which produces uh, a, an anticipation of the melting time. Another interesting analysis was also possible uh, with the different uh, elevation and here um, you can see the elevation like uh, between uh, 300 and 1000 meter, 1000 to 1, 2500 meter up to 4000 meter and then uh, 5500 meters and higher. And this shows that the percentage of areas because this shape is divided in uh, like uh, 1000 areas um, globally and here is the percentage and you can see that for snow cover area and snow cover duration the biggest changes are definitely at higher elevation and also um, interesting part is that between uh, so just to say snow cover duration means that the duration of snow is decreasing in general but the other question is what is uh, is because the snow is coming later or because the uh, melting is anticipated. In most of the data, roughly 54% uh, is uh, the uh, last day of snow nominating. It means that uh, it's more frequent that you have uh, a anticipated snow melt. But also is present, if not let's say in the majority, that also we have uh, a, uh, but you can see also in percentage, the one affected by significant uh, um, changes in the beginning of the season are less than the one in the melting part. But of course, let's say with respect to this uh, work, uh, there have been uh, some time, so then I did uh, an update, so it means until uh, that was until 2018, and this was un it is until 2022. So you see that more or less the patterns are quite similar, uh, but of course you have means uh, the curiosity to see what has changed in these five years. Uh, here you can see uh, where the um, let's say the red and the, um, the orange are the one which are or even more negative or stable. Instead, the, the one on the bluish part are the ones which are positive or even stable in this. And you can see that, uh, let's say, the um, reddish and the orange part is dominating the map. So it means that or some area have become even more negative, the trend, or more or less quite stable in the sense. And uh, of course, this work has been repeated for because up to now this is only snow cover area. This has been done also for snow cover duration. So you have always in this map first the period 2000 2018, then you have uh, 2022, and you can see that there's some increase. And here is the change, like map between the two, so showing the, the changes in these five years. This is the same for the first snow day. Here you have to mention that uh, uh, this or blue, but blue positive, it means in this case uh, a delay in the start of the season because um, the, it is done considering the uh, day of the year. And the day of the year goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, 365. So if there is a delay in the start of the season, this means that these days are uh, bigger because you go uh, higher values towards the end of the season. So it means that several parts are affected by delay in the start of the season. This is the same uh, mm, sorry, here and here again the changes and the same then for the last day of snow. This is the first, let's say, 18, 18 years, and then here again, 2022, and here the changes. Okay, this is a bit more stable, let's say. even though, let's say, the biggest always part is here, I think. But also here you see the Pyrenees, and also I see a small spot for Sierra Nevada. <laughs> 
And I, I saw the one of these, uh, this one, but also I did the one uh, including uh, 2023. And really it looks that one part of Sierra Nevada is getting uh, drier, it's less, less snow. So, with respect to the... And then, okay, just some statistics to show uh, the number of areas which have been significant in terms of snow changes and you can see that uh, uh, in all the different features there is an increase in the last five years. Okay. And particularly, for example, in the first um, 18 years here there was still some area with a positive and here disappeared completely. So it means, it seems that this year has been worsening a bit the situation regarding snow cover. So let's conclude. Uh, just to say a few words, what also can be done by this, because my idea now, um, let's say, even so, I'm a bit busy, let's say, with project, but the idea would be to close uh, this, making also this data available, uh, in so that other people can also use them for other studies. And, uh, and also, really, because these modest data have the possibility with a very high resolution, say relatively high resolution, uh, to have the uh, chance to identify also on a smaller scale what is happening regarding uh, uh, snow cover and the changes. And uh, as mentioned in this paper, uh, this Borman et al. 2018 uh, should be really a bit the direction of this type of sensor. So we need this type of sensor also for the future uh, because you need daily acquisition and also high resolution to understand the changes not only at the larger scale but also like in small valley on a smaller area. Uh, of course what we can do next and that's why uh, the next would be to update the parameters and what I'm doing now with the new version because of more this, there is a new version 6.1 where there are some slight improves, improvement in the data. Uh, introducing, for example, other parameters like snow albedo to understanding better the snow onset and smell change. And of course, these two, uh, which now will, I will uh, leave the floor to Rafa for the last part, understanding because the snow changes as relations other with other features in mountain areas, like for example vegetation, because there is a, if there is a, a anticipated melting, there is of changes also in the vegetation phenology. And at the same time, we have to mention that mountains are water tower, so then uh, affects the water resources in the downstream areas. So then the other question would be how to link and see if there are effects between the changes in snow and changes in the, the stream flow. And then for this reason, I leave the floor to Rafa for the second part. Thank you very much. If there are questions, I'm, I'm here. Any question? Sí. So, Claudia, um, in the, these five years, you, you have shown that there are some mm -hmm. changes in, 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 in some areas. So, yeah, in general, I mean, all of them are worse, let's say, no? Mm -hmm. Most of the, most most of the case. And the big, I mean, I have seen, like, for instance, in Norway, mm -hmm. most like, mm -hmm. and do you know what can... I mean, uh, here, in general, here, there is a, a positive part yeah. here, no? Yeah. Yeah, um, and means there is also here a positive part in the eastern part, and this is true more or less for all the parameters. For example, if I go here, oh sorry, also no cover duration, I guess. For example, yes. Um, okay, there have been several explanations. I just report one. Uh, and this is also true for glaciers and for sure it's been already tested and proved in the, in the eastern part of Russia. So um, what happened is that there is an increase of temperature in general. Temperature is still below zero. In this case, if there are humidity, this increase of the temperature means more snow. And uh, in, uh, in the eastern part of Russia, it's been already also disconnected to problem with permafrost. 
because there is this increase of the temperature, but still below zero. Like before it was, I don't know, minus 10. Now it's minus 2. So it's still below zero, but closer, let's say, to the zero. And there, in that case, in that specific, um, let's say, um, condition of temperature, if there is humidity, this increases the snowfall. Right? But having more snowfall prevents the soil to be frozen. And because, so, you know, snow uh, acts as an insulator in practice. And then uh, determine the problem that they have with permafrost because they are losing a large part of the country which normally before was completely uh, frozen. Yeah. ...in areas worldwide to changes in the stream flow. And let's see, I mean, if we see yeah, some connection between the changes in the snow and the changes that we can observe in, in stream flow in mountain areas. I mean, as, as you all know, I mean, mountain areas are water tower that they provide you know, water to the, all the downstream area of, 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 the, of the catchment that they belong to. Belong. And, I mean, in the current warming situation, they are vulnerable, especially uh, vulnerable to, to, this, to these changes. And, yeah, in principle, I mean, we have like a variation in temperature and, and precipitation, and they can be coupled or, or, or not. So, the impact in that we are observing the seasonality of, of the snow can have an impact or not in, the, in, the, in what happened in downstream. So, uh, yeah, and this was the set here. So, has this impact? So, how is the link between, no? This, there's no changes and the changes that we are or not observing in the stream flow. So are the changes that we observe in the snow cover area having a direct impact uh, downstream, in the downstream volume of, of, of the stream flow that, that we have? Or are the changes in the stream flow driven by changes in the snow cover area? So we can have both. So maybe we observe something in the snow cover area and we want to see what happened in the downstream, in the stream flow and, and the opposite. So, for that, for that is what we try to, to answer in this work. So we try to evaluate the nexus between the snow and the stream flow in mountain areas worldwide in the last two decades. I mean, I must say that also, I have said for you to have a number in mind, uh, approximately uh, uh, 15, 15 of the total water in the, in the world came from, from, from mountain areas. So what we have done? So we have Using the same approach that Claudia did, we took the shapefile of GMBA, that is a shapefile that produces uh, delineated in the mountain areas. So you see here in green, in dark green, all the all the areas with with mountains that Claudia has presented before. Then uh, we have data from snow that the, what Claudia presented, they come from from Modis, and we have followed the same algorithm she, she did to produce the same type table. And what is the new, uh, uh, the new step here? We consider stream flow data. So there are uh, stream flow data databases worldwide. We have using one that is consistent and they, they have the uh, previous filtering of the data. So there is a consortium of different countries worldwide. They provide some data, each of the countries, to this database. They check the quality and they, yeah. There is a repository in which you can download it. And this is called GRDC, this Global Runoff uh, Data Center, and they have data in the in the whole in the whole world with the same type of of uh, What we we did so we took all the I mean each of these dots that you see here correspond to the outlet of one catchment that the upstream area belong to a mountain area of the one that we have defined in this GMBA file. So in total, you see all the dots that, that we have. Again, we have a lack of information in yeah, Siberia, Russia, and yeah, the, all the Tibetan plateau in this database. I mean, if you go and contact people directly from there, maybe there are some information available, but we also wanted to have like an homogeneous database that has almost the same type of, of quality, quality assurance. And in this part of the world, there are data especially from previous year, like I mean, ending at the 2000, so from the 80s, 70s, there are information, but not in the last year. We have observed, like, in another study I participate, that there is a huge decrease of 
stream flow data worldwide. And especially this is not noticeable in Africa and in all the part I mean, South America too, I mean in the Amazon and also in this part of, of, of the world. So and then we want also to as Claudia mentioned, we, we want to, to see what is the influence of if there is some connection to the meteorological information. So we use para five data for meteor meteorology in this area. So we took the period 2000-2022, and with that we have we have in total 616 catchment with information of stream flow worldwide. We delineate the catchment. I mean, most most of them GRDC provide you with the the shape file of the catchment, but some of them not. So we took a yeah did the elevation model and we we did, we did this delineation of few catchment that we didn't have. So uh, out of all of them. We just pick 550 approximately that are the one that at least 10% of the surface was covered by snow in in average in the whole period that we are. So uh, we are now working with this uh, 550 catchment worldwide, which are the ones we can obtain. So which are the variables that we define in the case of snow? Claudia has explained. We follow the same algorithm. So we calculate. The first snow day, the last snow day, the duration between this first and last, and also the snow cover area that we have. And these are the, the, the values that we use for first. So for stream flow, what we are trying to catch. So we want to we analyze the total uh, annual mean stream flow. We wanted to catch the maximum uh, stream flow, annual stream flow, and the time in which this peak was Rich because we thought at the beginning that I mean if we have a melting we have a big contribution of the stream flow due to this melting and we expected to have a peak of stream flow later than the last uh, snow day of the season. And regarding meteorology, for each of the catchment we calculate an average of precipitation, temperature, snowfall, radiation, snow, water equivalent at the annual scale. So the mean and the annual precipitation, the mean annual temperature, the snowfall, the radiation, etc. And we carry out this analysis at annual scale, but also by seasons, to try to understand uh, if there is there was some connection with the seasonality. Of with that, what we did? So uh, we carry out an, a trend analysis using the same test that Claudia used in the previous uh, study. So we use a non-parametric Mantendal test for that, and we calculate for to see if there was if we have some. Uh, Significant in the change, we calculate the non-parametric sense load instead of the correlation because the world is was more. I don't remember exactly what, what we choose this one, but the other because was more. We choose the sense with the instead of Pearson more, uh, more robust. Robust no? against outliers. Yeah, yeah. So it's more robust against outliers. And we took, I mean, or we carry out two analyses. So first, we start. Okay, we have all the catchment worldwide. We have the snow cover area, we calculate the significant. So for this area in which we have significant change in the snow cover area, we saw or we tried to see if there was changes in a uh, stream flow. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So there is changes in a snow cover area and, and about these areas in which we have changes, there is also changes in, in the stream flow or not. And then we analyze the one that we have changes in the snow cover area and not changes in the stream, and the other way around. First, we took you know, the catchment in which we have significant, significant change in the stream flow and analyzed if these changes in the stream flow were due to changes in the snow cover area. So the, the two approaches. So first, changes in the snow cover area, and we try to understand if they, they have implication in the stream flow, and the other way around. We have changes on the stream flow and see if there were some changes also in, in the catch. Yeah, and we carry out the analysis of significant at 5%. And with that, we can have changes in, in phenology. What we can have, so we can have, I mean, a shift in the season, like moving the season later. So we have a later snow season when the snow cover, the first snow day is moved ahead, and the last snow day is also moved ahead. We can have a longer snow season if the changes is in the opposite direction, or a shortened snow season, or an early snow season. So we are following this 
a color code in the map that I'm going to show later to understand, to try to explain if we have a significant change, if it was due to this movement later before increase or, or decrease. What you can see here, I mean, it's a bit too much information maybe, but we have plot, I mean, for all the catchment that we have, this uh, 550 catchment, there is a dot here, and it represents the relation between the snow cover area against the Q mean, the volume, the mean Q volume that, that we have. They, they, they were the two main variables that we want, we want to analyze. So the color scale, as I mentioned before, are connected to later, earlier, longer, or short. And then for the one that we have significant, there is this uh, different symbol in the in the graph. So what does it mean? That the one that have a square, I don't know if you can see, and also a black dot, means like they both are significant. The changes in the snow cover area and in, in Q. Okay? And if you see, they are mainly located over here. So, in general, as expected, not the highest the, the snow cover area change with the highest to mean and vice versa. So, in principle, we expected like a connection, a relation, linear relation over here. If you see by color, the phenology of the snow change are almost clustered. So, we have we see here like the ones that are shorter that are connected to a uh, decrease in the snow cover area and also a decrease in, in springfall. Here we have the blue one, but I mean, not more, some of them are not significant, but also are located over here, so longer and, and longer. And yeah, the, the decrease and increase seems to be somehow... Okay, so and yeah, so... If we are here below, we have less stream flow, more stream flow, less snow, and, and more snow. So, and we just wanted to say, like, like the behavior is not clear when the change is connected with the shift of the timing of the season. So, the pink and the bluish, the light blue, are not, they don't follow the, a clear plan. So we have like the red one, the blue, dark blue, but here we have a mix. mix. Uh, so if we uh, analyze out of them, which uh, by season, which are the main triggers of, of these changes, we observe that in general, <coughs> uh, precipitation in some cases. So, no? you, you, you observe like mainly the changes are due to a negative value of precipitation and mainly in the. Um, in the summer. Why? Because, I mean, we will see afterward that all of these catchment are located mainly in the southern hemisphere and, and in Chile. So it seems that the precipitation is the, word, is the one triggering the changes, the significant changes in the connection between uh, snowfall and, uh, sorry, uh, snow and, and stream flow. And regarding the, when we analyze the significant change in the, stri in the stream flow, we also observe similar, similar, similar pattern worldwide. Uh, yes, so here I just took I just took the the data, the significant data, the data that are significant in snow cover area and in stream flow that are located here, the one that just ja, the, that only have the, the square correspond to just changes in significant area but not changes in, in stream flow and the opposite, the blue dot, just stream flow and not the other one. So what we observe we observe that in the case in which we <coughs> just plot the one with significant change in the snow, they are located here, and this one are located over there. So we have like less stream flow, more stream flow, less snowfall, and less snowfall. And what we observe that it seems that there are some areas in which we can identify some threshold. So it seems like when the for having a significant decrease in a snow cover area, we need a value below 0.05 and also a value below 0.01 here to be both of them significant. So it seems that there is some limits in which that tell us when there is a difference between the significance and the non-significant. And also the same here. The significant, it seems to be connected with 
no? Uh, dec and decrease minus of this value to be able to, to have this, this value. Where are these catchment uh, located? So, first, the one that has significant in both of them, you see, like main, most of them, I mean, they are just 22 catch, 28 catchment, and they are mainly located in the Andes. And we observe that these changes here in the Andes were uh, driven by <coughs> a decrease in the temp in the precipitation rather than a decrease in the temperature. Uh, as Anna mentioned, we, with the colleagues, we we were in a conference some weeks ago, and our colleagues there were also from Chile were telling that that's that they were happy to see that someone told also that was the precipitation and not the temperature who is dri driven the impact in the changes in the stream flow. No, because everyone thought that the changes in the changes in the snow are due to the temperature, but no, is in, in this case we observe we observe that, and all of them the the thing that we are observing is they are making shorter snow snow period, and the implication is that in total we observe that in these 22 years we have a, yeah a lost of approximately one month in the last snow uh, day of the of the season. So it's a lot in 20 years, so like 30 days you know, in this catchment that we are uh, highlighting here. What happened in which areas we have a significant change in the snow cover area, but not a significant change in the stream flow? So mainly all of them are located in the Alps and in the northern part of the Earth, up to the Alps. Because we see here, I mean, this is the, the divided area so all of them are uh, above so we are observing a change in a change there in the snow but apparently this change is not significant in terms of stream flow with these 22 years that we are analyzing then we have some spot over here but i mean they are not concentrated as they are in the in this area and finally um, what happened in what happened in the places in which the significant we have a significant change in the stream flow and no a significant change on the on the snow cover area so they are mainly located here in the state some spot also also in in chile but yeah we don't see a change a real change significant one in the in the snow cover area okay so there is no clear pattern are uh, yeah the northern latitude the shift is toward later on the season as you see here this pinky uh, values over over there. So these are the spots in which we are seeing changes in the stream flow, but no due to a change in the snow cover area. So uh, the conclusion. So this is a preliminary result. We need to tune it and try to understand better which are the the actual connection that we are observing. But just 15, uh, 16 percent of the catchment that we have we have analyzed show a significant correlation between the mean and the stream flow. Most of them were located in the southern hemisphere. Uh, yeah. And for these ones, we observed like 28 days of uh, anticipation of the last snow day, so a huge shift. And it seems that precipitation is driven that instead of temperature in these areas. And yeah, the areas more affected worldwide seems to be the, the Andes Cordillera because I mean they have also facing a huge mega drought in the last in the last 10 years. So next step is trying to yeah go in deep in each of these catchments, try to understand better, draw the ideograph, draw the phenology one by one and try to, to see which are the actual changes and let's see if we can yeah be able to understand better and perfectly what is what is happening. Thank you. Andres. <laughs> um, so you are trying to find a correlation between a volume, which is the, the stream flow, yep. and an error, which is no code. Yep. I don't know much about snow, but would be also uh, some data that you are missing the depth of the snow important, and you might, if you will be able to, to get that data, you will find maybe a better correlation, or do you think that is not important? Yeah, I mean, it's important in this 
variable is called snow water equivalent, is the amount of water that we have in the snowpack. Retrieving that from remote sensing is very complicated, it's almost impossible. There are huge, a lot of people trying to do that, but I mean, we don't have the ability now to penetrate to, to in, in the snowpack to be able to retrieve that. So, uh, snow covered area has been used as a proxy of, of the, the volume of, of water that we have. So, if we are able to connect a snow covered area with a stream flow, in the end, we, we are filling this, this gap of, of information. So if we see a connection, there's no cover, there's no water equivalent is somehow, uh, is, is somehow there. But I mean, it's not just that because I mean, it's not, it's not the depth, it's also the density. So depending on the time of the, the period of the season of the snow in which you are, the density change. So the density of the snow when it falls is yeah, around 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and then the, the, this density evolves. And this is connected with, for instance, the snow grain size, <laughs> the snow albedo, and yeah, many properties that are not easy to, to, re to directly measure in a spatial scale. So of course there are mm, data of people that goes to the field as, as, and measures no water equivalent in a point, but I mean this is their punctual. So the connection between these two variables is, is tricky and for this reason is really key to understand what is the relation between snow covered area and, and stream flow to, to be able to, to understand what, what happened. You can use model for that, but yeah, models are also have uncertainties and and this all this. Thing. I mean, they're just like the significance of both. It's just in the Chilean. It's in the Chile, in Chilean Andes. And like going on like for a really long time, and you're kind of like capturing that. Yeah. No? Yeah. And in the end. I mean, in the end, in the other ones, it may, you may need more data to know what, what is the, the, the actual trends. I mean, we have just 20 years of consistent data, and I, we are also limited by that because we, we just wanted to use observation in this study. We don't use to we don't we didn't want to use uh, models because in the end, I mean, models can alter uh, not alter, but I mean, this not. Uh, observation. So in the, the catchments, because I was for example that in Sierra Nevada actually the amount of snow will influence the, 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 the stream. Yeah yeah. But that is not sorry, no I didn't get that. Um that the basins uh, there's no can I tell you go? So in which catchment there is no significant? Yes, relationship between the snow and the and the, and the stream. Yeah. What what can what can be the reason? Yeah. Yeah. But no, because I mean the catchment. Imagine, for instance, uh, if you have like a uh, catchment that is not driven. I mean, you have like a big aquifer. So maybe the the, the way in which the snow is melting this year is favoring that the water infiltrate and go into the aquifer. So maybe the aquifer is not full. So the this is now that this water that goes into the uh, in the aquifer, you cannot see the, this year. It maybe will come in some year. So I mean, this is a connection on that. And also the thing is like, we can have a shift because we have a snow, but there's no, what happened in Sierra Nevada is like, as Claudia mentioned before, we, in Siberia we have like an increase in temperature that goes from minus 20 to minus 15. So I mean, you are still minus. So in Sierra Nevada, the thing that happened, or in all the Mediterranean catchment, is that this shift is going from, my, for instance, minus 2 to 2. So we have a lot of snow that is not snow anymore, that is rain now. So this change of snow into rain can alter also the stream flow dynamics, so it can complicate everything. Not complicate, but yeah, make like the dynamic change. Yeah. So for this reason, we want to study the peak. So because the peak, which, which tell us if this peak is due to the snow, because it's after the last snow day, or if, if it happened before, is mainly triggered by a change in precipitation or a huge precipitation that is the one that is changing the volume in, in, in the stream flow. So it's tricky, I mean, it's really complex, <laughs> all the snow. Yeah, the idea was try to, to have a plot of try to understand if the hotspot that Cloud identified are changing. We are observing. After the drought, that will happen to like the planet. 
I mean, if you have a if you have a catchment that is driven by groundwater, yeah, for sure. But also depending on how quick is the melting, because if the melting is really quick, you have a direct impact in the stream flow. If the melting is, is less, I mean, it's not as fast. Yeah, I mean, this is this paper of this Musel Muselman. Muselman, yeah, there is also this uh, Muselman 2017, which says that who says that uh, you cannot expect that simply because uh, uh, there is an earlier melt, you have a shift also in the peak. Because uh, if the melting is happening in April, May, you have certain type of energy from the sun. If it is happening earlier, it's less energy, and that means this melting is not happening like so quick. quick. You have a slower melting, and means the peak is not so strong. Anymore. So evident like uh, uh, the one that you are not, let's say, normal or you know, normal conditions. So it's really interesting, no? It's called. Slower snow melt in a warmer in a warmer world, so yeah. So it's also the input of the energy balance that change and everything can change. So yeah, I mean it's not straightforward. No, no, no. Yeah, sure. And if you want to say something about the snow water equivalent retrieving, but. Yeah, it means uh, uh, now means it, it, you are right. Is definitely the that of course we are observing uh, a area rather than a volume, and then there could be some bias. Even though in say in all these studies, the idea is a bit this one. So even though you do not have uh, values on the area, on the volume, you use the area as a kind of proxy, assuming. Uh, that the changes in the volume is also affecting the changes in the area. Even because then you are considering also other variables like um, the duration of the snow, the time of the melting and so on. Of course, it's not... Uh, um, unfortunately, exactly available as ground measurements, there are some, but yeah. different to cover large areas. And from satellite, you have mainly... Club snow, no? ...course resolution, so that now is not really the case. Maybe the only one we still want to address is some model data yeah. in the era 5, if just to see if, for example, there uh, we see some different patterns. Uh, exactly the direction of what you mentioned. So here we analyze the snow water equivalent as an output of the Aero 5 to see, I mean, if we were on the same path, no, if if, exactly. if the snow cover area was an actual proxy of, of uh, yeah, we see that, that it was. We also to understand, for example, we see changes in the snow cover area, but not the snow water equivalent, or vice versa. This means that these. Uh, Maybe proxy conditions sometimes could not work. But in general, it worked. Can you identify catchment? Or you can say, what well, is catchment probably the effect of the depth is going to be more important than in another catchment or area around the world? I don't know. Right. So the connection it's between. One catchment, I expect that the depth is not going to be that big. <laughs> And then the area is going to be a better approach than another catchment that maybe you expect the to be. To be, yeah, it could be. I mean, the thing is, like, to, to be able to do that, I mean, w we have done this type of analysis here in, in Sierra Nevada, no? I also, I mean, Pedro in the, in the PhD. I mean, and we have seen that depending on how the, the snow melt, maybe the, the, the snow cover area is more or less representative of, of that. If you have a shallow snowpack, I mean, it's true that uh, if it's really shallow, but in the case of this shallow, the duration is, is, is short. So it's always a connection between the duration, the, the area, and the when it start and finish, and also the precipitation. No, you, you can use the amount of precipitation that you have had, the snowfall, to, 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 to more or less yeah, gather, no, gather, no, uh, yeah, try to understand what is the amount of snow that, that, that you have. But yes, I mean, there are definitely there are catchments with the same snow cover area that, I mean, in general, the, la the, the snow lasts longer and there is more snow water equivalent, more water in the snowpack. Sí, algo más. Pues muchas gracias. Thank you for coming.